If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. In 2007, I presented a documentary called Enemies of Reason. One of the people I interviewed was Craig Hamilton Parker, a medium who claims to communicate with the dead. I've just listened to it again. I think it's complete nonsense that he communicates with the dead, but I have to say, he comes across to me as completely sincere and also rather intelligent, articulate, and fair-minded. I think many mediums are out-and-out -out charlatans. I'm pretty sure Mr. Hamilton Parker is not. As usual with uncut and unedited footage, I have to warn against smart Alex who say the cameraman must have been drunk. They simply display their ignorance about how a film is made. Actually, also, their lack of common sense about how a film obviously has to be made before it gets to the editing stage. Point is that we're used to seeing edited footage in which the sweeping around of the camera and the zooming in and out have all been eliminated. Also, the director may stop the camera and ask for a question to be repeated or phrased in another way. This inevitably leads to repetition, which of course you don't see in a final edited production, so please don't be impatient with such repetition. Here then is my interview of Craig Hamilton Parker. Well, that was a very engaging performance you gave us the other night, but I'm curious what actually goes on in your head when you're getting these messages that you're relaying to people. Difficult question to answer. Um, it's not really a rational thinking process. I believe that I'm in touch with my unconscious mind, and that's, um, I believe it's a little bit like my experience of it is a bit like the way ideas will come into a person's head. Like they'll, they'll come into a person's head almost like a fully formed idea and we don't know where it's come from. And um, it's a little bit like that. I think you could call it your intuitive mind, I, I, would, I would think of it as. But do you hear voices? I mean, do, do you sort of hear a male voice or a female voice or...? or... Um, it's a mixture of all the oh, seeing, hearing, feeling, sensing, all of those things come together. But it's more like an in blending of thoughts. It's as if my thoughts have been interlaid with another set of thoughts. And it's as if all I really need to do is look within myself. It's a form of introspection that I do. And it's from that I give the information I'm giving. And um, that seems to correspond with what the person um, understands about their person that passed over. Sometimes you, you feel it's coming from this part of the hall or that part of the hall. So yes, there's a what's, sensation what's of where it's coming from. And you get a kind of glow from it's that again, part of the it's hall? Like, that comes like a gut feeling. It's sort of like it's almost pulled from the stomach, is the feeling I would explain that as. I just feel I know I've got to go to that place or I know I've got to go to that person. Hmm. And you can't just think, oh, I think I'll go over that side of the hall because I've been to that side first. You might find a whole cluster of people you, you tend to do all at once, which is, you know, just the way it goes. You, you're pulled to that direction, mm. and that's how I feel it works. Now, why do you think you're talking to dead spirits rather than, for example, picking up telepathic messages from the people in the audience, say? Um, well, if you can accept telepathy, it could... Well... <laughs> <laughs> I don't. But um, telepathy, it could be telepathy. It could be argued that it could be telepathy. Um, I would argue against that in that in some instances I've had instances where people have come to me afterwards and said that there's something... I, for example, said to one woman, uh, there's a tin of green paint falling in your garage. And she went home and she found a garage was covered in green paint. Now, she didn't know that tin of paint had fallen, therefore I could not have read it from her mind unless somehow my mind had been able to see remote viewing in another place. We could always argue with one way or the other how ESP works. But I think that when you bring it all together, from my understanding, it is a connection with the spirit world rather than telepathy with the person. Do you have any trouble in the churchyard and picking up lots of... <laughs> yeah, lots of... quite often drop in for a chat, eh? <laughs> no, I, um, places like this, we believe that the spirit world is separate from the earthly okay. world. I mean, you get lots of silly programmes that talk about ghost hunting and things like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's vibrations, maybe there's these things called residual energy they talk about. But I believe in the spirit world that we go to after death. All I argue is that the personality continues after death. I don't even know if there's a god. But I can argue that there's the, well, what I try to prove through what my work, that life continues, that our personality somehow survives. Do you find a churchyard rather a 
crowded place? Have you got the bandwidth to cope with it? <laughs> yeah, a good place to drop in for a chat, <laughs> yeah. I suppose. But no, I think the churchyard, actually, you might feel the residual energy psychics talk about of people that have been here before, i.e. the people that have grieved here before and so forth. But I believe that this, what happens is the spirit goes into what we call the spirit world after death. And um, that world is a world that I hope I can prove through, through my mediumship and um, is something that is, I believe we prove fundamentally the continuation of the personality after death. I don't even prove there's a spirit world. I don't even prove there's a God. But what I tend to do, I believe, is suggestive of life after death. I think if I were talking to someone in the spirit world, I wouldn't waste time talking about tins of green paint. I'd say things like, what's it like being dead? What's God like? Um, you know, things. I mean, can you see the whole of the universe? Can you see what everybody's doing? Uh, why do you ask them such banal questions? <laughs> yeah, good point. But I think what happens is that um, it's the way the mediumship works. Mediumship comes, I believe, from the non-rational, non-verbal parts of the brain, if there's such a thing. I believe it's like a holistic understanding. It's a blending of thoughts between myself and the spirit communicator. So often the things that will come to us may be things that I can grasp. I, it's not like a telephone call to them and able to give this, 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 this. Sometimes we get what we call clairaudience, where it's a, it gives me the feeling of like hearing. But most of the time it's what we call a clairsentience, a sensing of the personality, the feelings, the sensations. And sometimes the smallest things can be very important. For example, um, my wife said recently to a sitter, um, I wanted to give you a tin of bovril, not bovril, um, Brasso, the cleaning fluid. And the woman had given that as the key word that she was going to be the key word to say that I, when I survive, I'm going to show you a tin of Brasso. They'd already pre agreed that. So sometimes little things could be hugely significant. But if only it could be just like a telephone line. Um, us mediums are working through a very difficult. Uh, form of communication, which is not like the normal earthly communication. So that's why the spirits don't tell you things clearly, but you get these kind of vague a word that sounds a bit like the word that, that the person's looking for, something like, I mean, I was struck, for example, that you said something like Simon Bennett, and there was a girl who said, oh, well, my boyfriend was called Ben, and he had a friend called Simon. And i sort of wondering, why don't the spirits kind of talk to you more clearly than that? Why do they use this obscure roundabout, almost like solving a crossword clue? Yeah, I think you could argue that people try to make things fit sometimes, and sometimes people do do that. But I believe that sometimes what we're getting is we're getting the kind of the whole picture. It's a bit like when you're dreaming. When, when, you, when you're asleep and you dream, you've, you've got a, a, a mental process going on, but it's completely different to the sort of mental process we use in waking life. And it's very similar with mediumship. We're getting the information almost all at once sometimes. It's a, a thought communication as opposed to a verbal communication. So words can be particularly difficult. Names can be particularly difficult sometimes because that's all out of the rational mind. I think this was probably here, um, perhaps in times before we developed language. Maybe it would have made environmental sense for us to be able to um, communicate by telepathy when we couldn't use words. It would have made some form of sense if we had a gut feeling that the, the water hole was poisoned or that we were being stared at by dangerous animals. I mean, these things perhaps were there before language developed. Well, in your performance the other night, you, you got a few hits in amongst the misses. Um, isn't what you're doing cold reading? Well, it depends what you call cold reading. This is something that a lot of the rationalists have come up mm. with, the saying that what you do is you say something and people basically make it fit. And uh, I think there sometimes can be cases where people do make things fit and they do try to sort of use convoluting thinking to try to pull um, disparate things together again. But I think when you really examine the evidence of what myself and other mediums do, you will find that a large, large proportion could never be explained away by something like cold reading. It's because there are sometimes such specific details that come through that there's absolutely no way that anybody else in that audience could ever take in that fact as their own, but only the person that was the recipient of that message. One of the things about specific information like that, which I agree with you, is, is impressive, is that only the stories which are specific are the ones that get repeated. I mean, you told us the green paint story just now. You don't go around telling stories where what you um, said, what you predicted, didn't happen. Uh, so 
um, there's a kind of one-way filter whereby only the, only the impressive stories, the, the green paint stories, get repeated. And no doubt many viewers of this program will go away and tell other people about the green paint story. But you don't say, do you know, I went to a medium and he said that, I, that there would be green paint um, for, in, in my garage and I went home and do you know there wasn't? Mm. That people don't repeat those stories. True. You're talking about selective memory, aren't you, here? That selective people can memory kind and of selective remember repeating. the things they want to remember. Yes. And I'm sure that would be the case for anything. I mean, uh, I expect uh, it's happened in science as well, I should think, where people have seen what they want to see. But I think if you do examine the body of evidence carefully, you will find that there is a, a large bulk of what is said is accepted by the person. I don't claim to be 100%. I think that would be arrogant to say that. I think I get a lot wrong, and I think other mediums do get a lot wrong as well, because it's such a difficult form of communication. But I believe that within it, there is... Uh, a large body of evidence would be suggestive of life after death. And it, within that, too, there are sometimes things that are so very specific that it, you've got to think about it. Something that will stand out that is, you know, so absolutely specific to that person that that does... It certainly should be worthy of investigation by science, I feel. Well, science is always ready to investigate things. Um, the thing about science is that it, it investigates the whole picture. It investigates all the misses as well as the hisses, as, as well as the hits. It counts the misses as well as the hits. And it, that there is a real risk that only the hits get, get published or get repeated. It does happen in science. I mean, there's, there's a risk in science that I think it's called the, um, the desk drawer effect, whereby studies that apparently don't show an effect don't get published. They get stuck in the desk drawer. Mm. And only the ones that apparently do show an effect end up getting published. Mm -hmm. So there is a danger of a kind of one-way filter, which we have to be very careful of. And it also can be... Um, people like myself, people that are into all the mystical things, have beliefs. But so do scientists have beliefs. And the problem is, I think, if you come to this subject with a, a, a pre-made agenda, to say it's all a load of nonsense, therefore, and then you start looking at it purely from the point of view, that's rubbish, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. When you start, these things are dealing often with human testimony. Just as in the, it's more like a court of law in some respects, because human testimony in a court of law will have a person perhaps hung. But in, in terms of trying to prove ESP or trying to prove the paranormal, um, that human testimony is analysed to the point that it becomes almost irrelevant. For example, often they'll say, oh, that medium asked 20 questions when he was giving, giving the reading. But the questions will often be sort of, your father in the spirit world is named George, is that correct? Yes. He was a big man, is that correct? Yes. So, that, so often things like that can get twisted and distorted. And I think the body of evidence really has to be looked at in such a way that we have to take into the fact that we're not dealing in the same way as we are with hard science. We're dealing with people, with people's understanding of this, with people's... Um, if, if you've convinced a person that that's their grandmother to the point that they're actually crying, I mean, surely those tears enough are, are perhaps proof that they've had, they've had proof that that really is their grandmother that's making communication. I think communication. it could, could, could indicate just desperate wishful thinking, perhaps. I mean, one of the things I noticed looking around the other night at your, at your seance was that people did seem to be very, very anxious. They were on your side. I mean, they were really trying to help. And... Um, they didn't look terribly convinced. I, told them I didn't think they were very much. Did, I did. To be honest. <laughs> um, but but time and again, you you would you would say, and I thought, well, that's 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 a hit, isn't it? But yet they looked sort of unconvinced. They didn't really look very persuaded by it. And then it was as though they they were desperately searching around for a way in which they should make it a hit. For example, you you got a Morris Minor uh, the other the other night, and you said a black Morris Minor, and I went and asked the man afterwards, was it really a black Morris Minor? And he said. Well, no, it wasn't black, but it was very dirty, so it looked black. And I mean, that, that's a very typical example of where they're desperately trying to embrace within the envelope of what you've said something that actually wasn't it, wasn't in it. So you, you've got them on your side, and um, the, again, the, the, the girl whose boyfriend was called Ben, and uh, and 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 so it wasn't Simon Ben; it was a, a boy called Ben who had a who had a friend called. Simon, you sort of feel if you start allowing, and actually you were rather good at picking up on, on those cases where the, the audience might have thought it was a hit, but you, as it were, discounted it. I, I was rather yeah, I think it's impressed with that. I think it's important that you try to discourage people from making things fit, because that, I agree that would discredit any good evidence that I was likely to give. I would rather get a lot wrong 
and one thing absolutely right, rather than people try to just be helpful or try to make things fit in. And people do have a tendency to do that, I do agree with you. But it does not undermine the fundamental fact that in good mediumship, facts can come through that can, I believe, give absolute proof that the personality continues after death. Do you, do you see your role as essentially pastoral? I mean, are you, are you trying to help people? No, not really. Not pastoral in that sense, because I'm not a great lover of religion in many ways, even though I tend to do this within spiritualism. I find that that is my outlet to do the work. Um, I, I feel that, in a way, it's just my duty, because if... Um, if I do have this gift and I can prove that life continues, I'm almost a bit reluctant as a medium. I came from a completely different background. I came from a background of working in advertising agencies and all sorts of things and was quite sceptical about the whole idea before it was proven to me first. And um, I feel that, uh, really, I don't think it's pastoral. I believe I'm helping people and therefore it's, it's, I believe it's a wonderful gift and I believe it must be used and I feel it's my duty. Do you feel it might actually be damaging to some people, but, as it were, stopping them from letting go after they've lost somebody that they love very much? Um, it's a good point that a lot of people bring up that, but I believe that it does help people to progress and move forward. I mean, because I believe what I do is absolutely true. I believe that I give... You people, really believe it? I believe absolutely Seriously, 100% you believe it? that it's true, because yeah. it's been proven to me against mm. what I believe is against my rationality. I believe it to be true. I would prefer in some ways to come onto your side and be rational and say it's all a load of nonsense because it makes it easier to argue. But it just, it's, it's been shown to me so many, many times that life continues. And personal proof that I've had that has given me proof of my father past a uh, continuation of spirit and my, my sister's proof that, that she had just after her husband died. I mean, incredible things that I are so very personal and subjective, they're hard to argue a case for. But for me, it's been life transforming. And I believe, as I was helped, I can help others. Have you seen any of the performances given by sceptics who are, ed who are educated in cold reading, expert in cold reading, actually showing what one can do with cold reading? I mean, they're, they're very impressive. They, they amount is essentially to conjuring tricks. Yes, I know. Uh, I've seen these and I can see how they the cleverly worded that it can be taken mm -hmm. either way. It can be, you can, this person's a, uh, a sceptical person that's also got a very open mind, you know, type of thing, and the astrology for, that's been made to fit and so Yes, there is a case for that. But don't let, I don't think that over, should overshadow the fact that, that, that true mediumship um, can actually give the sort of evidence that should certainly make the sceptic think. But if you go to a really good conjurer, say a mentalist, Mm. And, and the conjurer's act is to read thoughts, and, they, and they, they call it reading thoughts. And, of course, mm. you and I know that, it, that it's just tricks. And they're 100% right. They get it right every single time. If they had as many misses as you were getting, or as any spiritualist gets, they'd be booed off the stage. Mm. It'd um, probably be a bit more believable, too, actually. Because yeah. I think often it's the fact that sometimes mediums get it wrong, actually, that kind of proves that they're... Exactly. Not trying to make games yeah. up. Well, I mean, I, I think that's probably right, but you know. there's a sort of double standard where a conjurer has to uh, sort of, you know, actually show that he's got nothing up yeah. his sleeve and there are no wires under the table and, yeah. and, and so on. But somebody like you can get away with what? I mean, I don't know what sort of hit rate you get, about 10% hits or something in a, in, in a, t a typical evening. I um, hope it was a lot more than that. Well, but, um, um, and, and yet you don't have to go through the rigours of proving that you're not, um, that, that, that you're not, Cheating. Well, we do go through the rigours. Well, certainly within spiritualism, anybody working within spiritualism is carefully scrutinised. You, anybody couldn't just stand up and work within a spiritualist church. They do. They are carefully scrutinised before they work. Um, there are mediums out there that I would worry very much about, indeed. But I think if, and also within spiritualism, I mean, we're all doing it for free. We're all do giving our time for free. We're giving our, um, it costs you money to get to a spiritualist church and you only take a minimum sort of fee for your transport. I mean, it would seem a bit of a pointless exercise. I can't see the reason for doing that. Well, that's the most impressive thing you've said to me this afternoon, but that, of course, is not true of many in America who, who make big money uh, out well, of doing this kind of thing. Well, people can, mm. uh, but then also people, I, I don't, there's a lot of case to argue also that people should, uh, you know, doctors shouldn't earn money because they're saving people's lives and so forth. I mean. Once you accept it's a true thing, you see, from a sceptic's point of view, to say, you know, these guys are out and they're, they're, they're ripping people off on a very bereaved point in their life, you know, if you, if you believe it's all untrue, then yes, I would understand you would think it was an awful, awful thing. But if you do sincerely believe and know it to be true from your own personal experience, 
then you can look at it in a different way because then you can see that they're helping to people to pick up the pieces again and move forward and life for them becomes whole again. There's a lot to be said for the rationalist arguments. I'm, I'm not dis I, and I think the rationalists need to look at it as well. There's no reason they shouldn't because people tend to believe too many things before breakfast, like in Alice in Wonderland. But at the same time, there is a core of truth to it that I believe needs investigating properly. And that it's not just psychology with people making it fit. It's not mediums trying to trick people into, into believing things that they shouldn't. There is a truth behind it. And even though it goes against what we would, all our rational thoughts, it, there is a, another aspect of it to the world, I believe, that um, we can prove through mediumship. I think I believe that you're sincere. I'm absolutely sure that many of them are not. But thank you for being sincere yourself. Thank you. How do you know that it's not telepathy? How do you know it's the spirits talking, not people in the audience communicating directly to you? Well, something telepathic has to be already in that person's mind. So if there's something I can say to the person that um, is, they don't know anything about, for example, there was an instance where I said to someone that um, there was a tin of green paint falling in your garage. And when they went home that day, they found a tin of green paint had actually fallen and there was green paint all over the garage. They didn't have that in their mind. So it was obviously coming from another source, which would have been, um, I believe, the spirit world. If not the spirit world, perhaps some form of remote viewing. But either way, they're unusual. They're, they're certainly a, would disprove, I think, telepathy itself. So do you think the spirits can actually see all, everything in the world? Tins of green paint everywhere, um, um, cars driving down, down the road, uh, power stations. Uh, yeah, I believe they're aware, aware of this world, definitely. How much they can project onto the medium's mind. I mean, if I was a brilliant medium, I might be able to tell you, you know, the number on the, uh, a random number generator. But the whole thing is with mediumship is it works through that, what I believe is the intuitive side of the mind, the non-verbal side of the mind. So often the information that we're able to be pick up is often has to come through our intuitive sensing side as opposed to our logical mind. My being impressed at your, um, some of your hits was slightly lessened after the meeting when I went around and talked to some of the people and learned that many of them keep coming back to the same uh, thing again and again. They know each other and they know you and you've read some of them sometimes three times before, which suggests that you could have been using the same information that you got from at them out of a pre on a previous occasion. I mean, that, that's one problem with this sort of coming back. The other problem is it suggests they might be a bit addicted uh, to this kind of thing. OK, there's two questions yeah. there. And uh, people do obviously come back to um, spiritualism often. And I, although I was not conscious of going to say, people that I'd been to before, I have been serving Camberley Spiritualist Church for some years. So there's perhaps a likelihood that I could have perhaps unconsciously remembered stuff possibly. But um, I do know that the information that is given is given in such a way that I, it's fresh to me. I don't know who I'm going to. Um, as for people coming back time and time again, well, if the best readings are usually when a person has had such proof that they never need to see a medium again. That would be the most successful of a mediumistic setting in my mind. That's usually done within the private sitting. But people also get a lot of solace and, I suppose, reinforcement by coming back and um, uh, sharing with others a spiritualist service. Um, that sharing is part of the healing process because bereavement is an awful thing to get over and it, it's something that people don't get over just because they've been given the proof there and then. It takes time and I think a lot of empathy comes between people sharing their, their, their experiences and uh, helping one another to um, make those contacts with the spirit world. But going back to the first question about the fact that you may have met these people before and therefore mm -hmm. have, have pre previous access to the information, there would be plenty of people who would have been impressed by some of the hits that you got without realising that, that actually you, you knew that, but whether consciously or not, you knew that because of pre previous encounters. So it does rather lessen the strength of the evidence that you keep talking about. Yeah, I think about. in that particular case, you, I, would, I would have said it would weaken the evidence there. Yeah. I would agree with you because I, it's much better if you've come to somebody um, you've never, never ever encountered before. And, and in fact, I didn't realise I'd been to that person before. I was, yeah. In fact, I was a bit shocked when yeah. she said, okay. you know. Yeah. But, um, but nonetheless, I think, again, with these things, it's, uh, I think it's, the, the, it's like with any scientific experiment. It's a number of proposals that are gradually build the evidence up to shape, say if a thing's correct or not. And I think with mediumship, it's the same. One needs to investigate quite a lot of it, quite a lot of mediums, to find out where the um, proofs are.
or not. But uh, I believe that the general bulk that has come through um, spiritualism certainly is convinced many a person and many a great mind, including, for example, um, uh, the fellow that helped Darwin, um, Albert uh, Russell uh, Wallace. <laughs> Alfred Russell Wallace. Who was, yeah. you know, I mean, he, he put the whole theory of evolution with Darwin originally. They presented it together and, in, and Wallace even sent his papers to Darwin, didn't he? Yes, he did. So you'd have been defending a spiritualist. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's well, slightly no, different no in question, history. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Wallace went decidedly odd in his old age, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, well, Newton the, went odd in his old age too, yeah, and so did Einstein. Did. You know, so, it's yeah. strange, isn't it? Um, <laughs> one one of the hits you got was uh, Mrs. Watson, and uh, who was a local school teacher. Uh, not not Watson, Mrs. Jenkins. Je um, I don't remember uh, Jenkins. Jenkins, Jenkins. Uh, yeah. Mrs. Je Mrs. Jenkins. Let's start that again. Yeah. Uh, one one of the hits you got was a local school teacher called Mrs. Jenkins, and uh, it afterwards turned out that, that that she was well known. I mean, she taught at the school. Prep, you know, maybe half the people there had either been taught by her or had children taught by her. So um, there would be at least some mediums who might have done a little bit of local research, looked up in the local paper or something, and found a name like Mrs. Jenkins that everybody would, would have known. Do you accept that some mediums might do something like that? I think it's pretty unlikely, to be honest, because it, I mean, I certainly wouldn't know that I come from Southampton, Camberley's quite a distance from Southampton, it would have been awful to have ever researched things like that. I don't think the general medium would research things like that. I do worry sometimes about TV shows when people are asked to sign who they want to get in touch with before they see the medium. Yeah, yeah. That worries me. Yes. So I certainly do think that we do need safeguards, and particularly me TV mediumship, I think there should be much more safeguards than there are, instead of just presenting it as entertainment and then that's it. Um, but I do believe that us mediums are generally are very, very rare to find anybody that would deliberately try to cheat. I'm sure you don't, or you'd have actually got more, more hits than you did, but nevertheless, there are some mediums who, for example, have stooges who go around the audience in, beforehand, I don't know, in the sort of coffee before, beforehand, and get some information and then feed it to the medium. Are you, are you aware that that goes on with some of your colleagues? Well, I think if it was to happen in spiritualism, it would seem a pretty lame thing to do, really. Of course it's a lame <laughs> thing to do, yeah. Well, because there's no, there's, there's no reason I could see them possibly wanting to do it. There's no financial reward. I suppose you could say there's an egotistical award, but that would seem to sit well. Well, there's well, certainly a financial reward in America. And I mean, one, one famous American medium did that. And he had a little earpiece. And it was actually, he was having information fed to him by stooges in, in the audience. And James Randi, the famous skeptic, had actually got an engineer to intercept the radio frequency. And so he could actually hear the messages being fed to the medium. And so the medium was saying, I'm getting somebody called Albert. Who is mm. Albert? Mm. And at the, just before that, you heard on the radio signal this, the, the stooge saying, ask him about Albert. Mm. Well, if anybody and, has done that, I think that they should be drummed out of mediumship yeah, and spiritualism. But this man and is doing very well. Also, spiritualists would also be the first to condemn. They have in the past thrown out mediums and exposed mediums that have cheated within, and they might have gone on to television sometimes later. But within spiritualism, you will find the safeguards are in place. And certainly that type of thing would never happen within the confines of spirit, which is the best place where people really want to investigate this, could start looking for the sincere mediums. You said that scientists also can be subject to delusion and to gut feelings which could be wrong, and that's true, which is one of the reasons why the scientific method has put into place a whole lot of techniques for specifically eliminating the possibility of that bias. So a scientist, for example, may deliberately deprive himself of the information when he's comparing say, an experimental with a control in any kind of mm -hmm. experiment, he doesn't allow himself to know which is the experimental and which is the control. Not because he thinks he could actually, he's actually dishonest, he's probably not dishonest, but because with the best will in the world, it's very difficult uh, not to be biased when you know what you're, what, what, what you're doing. So when you, when you defended spiritualism by saying that it's a human thing, it's not subject to scientific investigation, in a way that, that's selling the past because because what a scientist wants to know is can you eliminate the human mm -hmm. uh, the hu human element and actually demonstrate in some kind of a foolproof way that it's that it really is uh, 
not cheating and, and um, that it really well, is what, a genuine what effect. And what you've said, you're more or less thrown out the whole of psychology, really, because psych not, no. psychology works like this. I mean, no, nowadays people true. might say, well, Freud is probably completely wrong. Well, they would American say about that about Freud, idea, but, not, you know. but not about experimental psychology, not, not about psychology which actually does experiments and tests and very, very rigorous tests. Mm. For example, telepathy experiments are very, very rigorously controlled. Mm. Well, um, there's been some statistically... interesting experiments with telepathy experiments, particularly the experiments where people have been stared at, particularly experiments, some of the experiments using video imagery as opposed to the Zener cards, which is like static cards that people look at. And I, I'm, certainly I believe, believe that the bulk of what these paranormal researches are often shunned by normal, normal sort of mainstream science, as if there's something that we're worried about. Why should, as if it's threatening the very fundamentals oh, of science. It's not that. I mean, if, if, if I could demonstrate telepathy, I would, be, I, would, I would be absolutely delighted because I would be demonstrating a completely new force of physics that nobody had ever discovered before. If I could demonstrate telepathy really, really conclusively under, under controlled conditions, I would get the Nobel Prize for physics. And, that, and that's, that's not, not how Einstein seen. got his Nobel Prize by trying to disprove quantum theory. So maybe um, uh, it would take someone like yourself to ultimately trying to disprove it may actually eventually prove it. In fact, I think actually when we, the proofs will finally probably not come through psychology, it will probably come through something like quantum physics, because we don't even understand what awareness is, what consciousness is yet. And what I'm talking about is that we're involved in the world's introspection of human sense of being, of the feeling and sense of becoming in life. All those things are so hard for science to ever be able to apply the current rules we have of science to. Um, that I think what I'm doing is kind of in amongst that area. It's in the area which is very hard to prove with the normal um, dissecting tools of science. It's about the human condition and the continuation of the human condition after death. Scientists, in a way, protect themselves from the accusation of being deluded or self-deluded by doing their experiments under rigorously controlled conditions. So it's not that people actually believe that scientists are necessarily deluded, but they, they like to be assured that the conditions of, of the experiment are such that it, that it can't happen. I mean, would, would you submit to some such rigorously controlled um, experiment? I think there could be some very interesting ones that could, be take, so could take place. For example, I'd be very interested to know what happens um, if one's doing this type of work and what happens inside the brain. We can measure inside the brain with PEP scans and things like that nowadays. Is something happening inside my mind that's different to a normal person's mind? Has something changed in me when I um, claim to be in communication with another personality? Well, that, that we could look at. It wouldn't show that you are in communication with another But it would show that something's happening. It show that something different is happening. But what about this one then? So, suppose you just mentioned quantum theory and, and advanced physics like that. What about getting in touch with Einstein and asking him? I mean, why ask about these dull things like, oh, he still loves you and he misses you and, and the green paint? Why not ask a really interesting question? Yeah, I do um, agree. I know what you mean. But what I'm doing is proving the continuation of life after death, continuation, continuation of the personality after death. That's all I can really do, I believe. Um, I think perhaps the rest of the information has to come from the earthly plane. Yeah, but you could... You could really convince people if you did get hold of Einstein. And, but then and... also, then you could think about, if you said, get in touch with Einstein. Um, Niels Bohr had his inspiration that the atom turn, revolves, the, the proton revolves the atom, the, um, the, the electron revolves the proton. It came to him in a dream. So that came to him from his intuitive side. Oh, yes. So I mean, some of, some the, of the best ideas come in dreams. Often they do, and mm. some of the great inventions have come through dreams. And perhaps it's the same sort of type of way. It comes, you see, Niels Bohr didn't sort of suddenly, he, he had the, this dream that he then understood that this is what he was looking for. It's a, if his intuitive mind had given him an answer, which his logical mind couldn't. So maybe people like Einstein could perhaps communicate with us in some way to give us some information, but I don't think it would come out quite in the form of, say, for example, advanced mathematics, because I don't understand advanced mathematics. Well, it's a pity, because if it did, you'd really convince people. Mm, that, but maybe um, a mathematician could be inspired. Well, indeed, yes. I mean, that would be the kind of thing it would be... You see, uh, we, we believe that um, uh, all thinkers, probably including yourself, are influenced some way by our intuitive thoughts, and our intuitive thoughts are all in turn influenced by 
in other influences outside there's of There's no ourselves. problem about intuitive thoughts, and there's no problem about no, saying... I'm saying that, that the intuitive thoughts are in turn influenced by the spirit world. Well, yes, I know you are, but I mean, don't, 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 don't let's gloss over that, because that's yeah. a very, very important mm. additional thing. Nobody's going to dispute that Niels Bohr could have a brilliant idea in a dream, and various other scientists mm. have done the same thing. But it, you talk as though, by using the word intuitive, people are going to say, ah, he, he must mean the, the spirit world, and of course it's a very, very different thing. No, I'm talking about the intuitive mind itself, the same mind that we encounter perhaps in dreams and the unconscious mind that Jung talked about, the mind that's below the surface of our rational awareness. Because that's, you asked me earlier, where do, the, um, where do you get these impressions from? And that's where I believe it comes from, that sort of dark side of the mind. Well, I believe it comes from that too, but I don't believe it comes from the spirit world. <laughs> no, I, I, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.